Okay, welcome back. Um, yeah, so you saw what we did in the in the first part of this uh, pers this projection, not perspective projection. The first part we talked basically about parallel projection, but uh, you saw that what we did was was we could basically use all that we have done so far. Um, so we didn't really introduce any. I didn't really introduce anything new. It was mostly about uh, understanding why we do all those single steps and what the concrete values or, or conditions are, but the whole technique like window transformation, uh, mapping one coordinate system to another one, that was something that we already did before. Now for the perspective projection, we have to do something to introduce something new to our matrix technology to terminology to be able to do that with matrix multiplication. So let's look at to uh, 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 try to understand what, what happens when we do the perspective projection or when we, what we want to do here. So what we what we have is we have this view frustum where we have want to basically do a perspective projection with our near plane and our far plane. And then we want to move that into an orthographic view volume. So if we have, for example, two triangles here and the second one is here, and even if that is larger, I cannot see it. Then if, even if the second one is larger than the first one, I cannot see it from here because the first one covers it completely in the same way as if I hold up my hand, I cannot see a lot of people sitting there, although you are, of course, all bigger than my hand. Um, so when we do this autographic, uh, create this autographic new volume, this size relation has to be preserved. So the first one actually really becomes bigger than the second one. Even in reality, the second one is bigger because then when we project it, we only see the first one here similar to here. So we get the very same image. So we basically have to push the back part, the back part of our few frustum together to get this axis parallel box. And we have to push that in a way that depending on the distance, it gets pushed Yeah, more. Good. So let's uh, uh, think about uh, what what does that mean? What how we have to how do we have to push the points from the objects that we want to project? So if we have our viewer E here, and uh, think about this now, like uh, all your objects are, for example, glass marbles. So you can see through the objects, and your viewing plane is also a glass window. And then if you look through that glass window and make a circle with a marker around every object that you see all the objects that are on this line here from where you're looking at will result in the same, you will make the same circle around them here. So they will all be mapped to this particular point here on the viewing plane, which is the intersection of this line with the viewing plane. So all the points here need to be mapped here. And that means if we do an orthographic projection, that we project everything in this direction, that means that all these points here that are for the perspective projection projected to here need now be projected to here. So they need to be on this line here that goes in the direction of the, orthogonal, uh, of the parallel projection. So remember for the perspective projection we project towards a point and here we project in a certain direction. So we need basically to do a transformation that maps all the points from here to from the line in that direction to the line in this direction here, which is the direction of the orthographic projection. Now, uh, <clears throat> what you would probably assume is that if we move this line here to that line here, that we map the points in this way. Just move them down. But you see here that there is a very weird uh, mapping of the points. So this point is moved back. This point is moved for, for closer to our viewing plane. Um, but the, the, the thing here is that we're doing an orthographic projection. So it doesn't really matter where we have our points as long as the order is preserved. If that point is projected here, is moved here, then of course we have this point here in the viewing plane as a first point. 
and this has a second, so if this is a solid object, we don't even see this one, although in the original image it was in front of the other one. So we see here that the order is of course important, but the actual position doesn't really matter because we're throwing away the set coordinate in the end anyhow. So it doesn't matter where it ends up as long as we preserve the order and as long, of course, as those points do not move in front of the viewing plane or behind the far plane. So this is the near plane, this is the far plane. If we transform it in a way that it moves in front of the near plane or behind the far plane, then of course we have a problem. Even if there are no other points here, because when we move it behind the far plane, we don't draw it anymore in front of the near plane, the same. So uh, <clears throat> these are the important things that we need to remember when we do the drawing. Of course, we could just do this straight down projection, but the problem is that this is, cannot be done with matrix multiplication. And since we have this whole pipeline defined by simple matrix multiplication, it would be kind of stupid to have one step in the middle that is less efficient and doesn't fit into the whole framework. So if we want to do it with matrix multiplication, we cannot achieve this straight down projection transformation of the points, but we can achieve a uh, transformation that um, so, uh, um, follows these conditions. So the conditions that we have is that we want to map lines that go through the origin to a parallel line to the set axis. So that is basically this, what I said here, that, uh, let's draw another one. If we have a line here, then we basically say this point should stay fixed and it needs to be kind of tilted. So we have a parallel line to the set axis. Then, of course, the point on the viewing plane, they should not move because if a point is here, no matter uh, on which of the two uh, lines, it will always stay here. So this is one of the conditions that we have. We say the point that is here stays here. Also point on the far plane should stay on the far plane because if it is here, oops, uh, something's wrong today. Uh, it should not move outside because then we don't draw it anymore. And in between, we want to preserve the near to far order because then when we draw it, uh, I mean, think about it, we're talking about a single pixel that we draw later on the, Im on the screen. So uh, if you have two really next to each other, you would say, okay, doesn't it make a difference if I have a pixel here or a, pixel, uh, a distance here or a distance here, but we're throwing away the set coordinate and then it doesn't really matter where this pixel end up to, even in the original image they were neighboring pixels, neighboring uh, uh, points, because they just end up in one pixel here without the set coordinate. So just the order needs to be preserved. And uh, now let's look about what, uh, what we would need to achieve if we want to do like this, this perfect uh, straightforward way that we cannot do with matrix multiplication. Um, this is our I vector E our viewer position, this is the gaze vector, this is our viewing plane or the near plane N, and we have a point here that is on this line here, and that should be mapped, of course, to a value somewhere on this line with this distance here. So we need to have this YS, S for screen. Uh, so we need to transform the Y into the YS, and if you look at this, this is the distance from the viewer to the near plane, D, and this is the set value here of our point, Y set. So we're looking in, uh, this is the Y direction now. It's, uh, I think it would be less confusing if uh, it would be the X direction, but I took it from the book and I didn't want to change that because I think that's even more confusing. Um, <coughs> yeah, so this is, uh, looking in the, in the y direction now. 
um, but for the for the x direction, it's it's exactly the same. And if you look at these relations from geometry, we know from basic geometry, we know that the relation of y s to y is the same as the relation from d to d because we have two triangles here, and the second is just an extension of the first triangle. So if you don't remember that from basic geometry, just believe me uh, or look it up even better. Um, so this is the relation, and then of course it follows that y s can be calculated as distance to the near plane divided by the set value times the original y value and then we get this position here on this uh, uh, the y position on this line here but of course now the problem is and the same for the x value the problem is we need to divide by set and division is something we cannot do with matrix multiplication so we need x and y values like that. We need a set value that follows these conditions that we specified and for the x and y we need division and we cannot do that with matrix multiplication. So we have to change our, if we still want to use matrix multiplication, we have to change our matrix multiplication framework or we have to extend our matrix framework in a similar way as we already did when we introduced the homogeneous coordinates. So you remember we started with uh, saying that matrix multiplication can create a linear transformation. So if you have a point x, y, z, you can create points x dash, y dash, and z dash by multiplying it with a matrix and each, uh, so y dash and z dash uh, similar, uh, in a similar way. Um, so for each coordinate, we can create a value that depends on something like this, but we saw that we cannot create a value that where we add a constant term to it. And that's why we introduced the homogeneous coordinates where we just have made this trick that we add a value of one to the points here. And then we could create also these kind of um, coefficients. And um, that reminds me, um, I have to, uh, say that in the exam we I realized that uh, a lot of people uh, I think misunderstood that an affine transformation is affine transformations are linear transformations and translation a lot of people uh, misunderstood that I think and thought that an affine transformation is just a translation but that's not the case affine transformation is the overall subset of linear transformations and translation um, I don't know if I made this clear enough in a lecture, which is why we did not reduce points for that out. Of course, I want to make sure that you, uh, you know that. Good. Um, yeah, so we, we extended this to the affine transformation and uh, now we do another uh, extension that uh, is then the so-called projective transformation that allows us to create values of this style here, where we also can have a denominator where we have can divide by something and you see here of course oops sorry um, this is the important thing we need to have a set value here later to be able to create these x and y values um, but this is the general form by extending the matrix framework in a way I, I will just introduce uh, soon uh, we can create these kind of um, new values here and the extension is just replacing this one from the homogeneous coordinates with a specific value w that ha doesn't have to be one and represent a point for the homogeneous coordinates we said x y z one represents x y z so we just ignored the last co coefficient and if we extend it and have a value w here then we have to divide by all the coefficients by them before we for example draw the point on the screen and then of course this value here becomes one so we have again the same situation as here and uh, then we can do a matrix transformation that gives us exactly these kind of uh, coefficients here so if we do a matrix multiplication with this matrix here multiplied with a normal vector with homogeneous coordinates we get this vector and then based on this extension this definition here we say that this vector because the w is uh, unequal to one this vector represents this 
point here and if you do the multiplication here you will see you end up here a1x plus b1y a1x plus b1y plus c1 set plus d1 plus d1 this is exactly the first value that we get here same for the others now if you do the homogenization here which is not just removing the last coefficient but dividing all values with this coefficient here you get uh, something different than what I wrote here and this is just one sorry for that <clears throat> yeah good um, yeah and this is exactly what I said here we are able to get these kind of values with this kind of uh, multiplication now. Now, the trick is, of course, how do we choose, what kind of matrix do we have to choose to get exactly the values that we want, which are these two, two values for X and Y here. And this matrix is uh, this one here. So this is our perspective transformation matrix. Um, remember, we're looking in the negative set direction. N and F denote near and, near and far plane, and N is the projection plane. Then my claim is that this matrix gives us exactly the X and Y values that we want. So let's verify that. If we multiply any point in homogeneous coordinates with this matrix, we get X, Y, no, that is, uh, wait. I I was afraid that something like that happens. The problem is that the notation from the second edition of the book to the third edition of the book changed. And the slides the, from last year were, of course, with the second edition. So I hope I ho was hoping I made all the cor uh, corrections. I double-checked it. But uh, of course, with so many indices, you can miss something. So this is not correct. Let's see, is the other thing correct? No. Yeah. Uh, and this is just one. Yeah. But the homogenization. Wait, no. Oh. <laughs> I'm. I am afraid I will not be able to figure that out now without. Yeah, this should be Z, right? Yeah. But why is that? Oh, of course, yeah, 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 this is one. Yeah, thanks. Okay, one and Z. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, this is the thing when you do it here on the, on the computer instead of on paper, then you uh, get easily confused. Yeah, so that... Uh, that is correct, that is correct, and this is correct, only that here I forgot to, to update it. Um, yeah, let me explain this later, why why this, this came, that also explains the difference between the second and the third edition of the book. Okay, so we see if we do the homogenization, we divide then by this uh, value W, which in this case is not one, but Z. Then we get these values here, and we see the X, and the y and the set value are exactly what we want. So we were able to produce, oops, to produce these kind of x and y coefficients, although we are usually not able to do, or we are not normally able to do division with matrix multiplication, but if we extend it, we can do it. The question is now, uh, what does this set value look like, or, or what, what does, is this, set value we said we don't need to have a specific set value it just needs to follow specific conditions which were points on the near and the far plane are, are staying on the near and the far plane in the set direction and they do not change their order along the set axis and they are not moved outside of the view frost room. and we can easily prove that it's actually quite relatively simple to prove that so we have a value set s that is after matrix multiplication defined by this. And we say values on the near plane should stay on the near plane. So if set is on the near plane, 
then set s should also be n. If we put set n into this equation here, this here becomes n, and you see easily that set s is n, so this is correct. If it's on the far plane, set becomes f, so this value here becomes f, so set s also becomes f, which is set, so we are also correct here. Then we have to say <coughs> so see, see that the values do not move in front of the view frustum. So if set is larger than n, then set s should also be larger than n. And we see that here easily, if uh, or easily, uh, relatively easily, if we look at this, if set is larger than n, then this is uh, smaller than what, than f. And this means that this here is larger than zero. So we have n plus something that is larger than zero, and that's clearly larger than n, which is the value that we get, uh, which which is the near plane, which is uh, we, we which proves that set S is also larger than n, which was uh, what we wanted to prove. Same for f smaller than uh, uh, in front of the front plane, then set S. We can also prove that set S is smaller than f by looking how this value, what this value will be depending on set smaller than f. And uh, now we only have to check that the order is preserved. So if a value set 1 is larger than set 2, then set 1s should also be larger than set 1 and set 2s. So if we put this into the equation now, set 1s, actually I'm showing it the other way around in this direction now, but you can easily do it then from the bottom up as well. If we take set 1s, we get this value. Set 1, uh, set 2s is this term here. Now this here are exactly the same, so we can remove them. <coughs> and now I'm not sure, no, that. Yeah, that should stay like that. I don't know what I did here. And then if you change the, uh, the sign, it changes. But then if you take the, if you put the denominator on top, then the sign changes again. So this here is correct. That was, that's a mistake. Good, so we've proven all this. So the set really follows the, the conditions that we have. It's, it's kind of interesting to also look into what kind of values we get for set. So remember, we're looking in the negative set direction. So set S is, these are all constant factors. So we see set S really only depends on minus one divided by set. So that means if we draw that as a function, if we have set and here we have set S, we get a function that looks like this. So that, not, it doesn't go up here. So we see that if the objects are closer to the screen, they are mapped further away from each other. So if they are here, they are mapped further away from each other. And if you have objects that are further here, they are mapped, pushed to stuff that is closer to each other. Of course, if we stay, everything stays in the view frustum. If we create more space, we have to push somewhere else. But you see, it pushes for objects further in the distance and the objects that are closer, which are easier to see anyhow, are drawn more accurate. So this is kind of uh, also makes sense in terms of uh, rounding errors and stuff. Good. So we got our final matrix for the perspective projection. Um, and then we combine this with the orthographic projection matrix that we already had. That gives us this matrix here. And the reason why we have this matrix here is uh, then we can really just replace this one, which is for the par uh, parallel projection, with this one, <coughs> which is for the perspective projection. That's why I combined here the two matrices into one, because then here this formula becomes much more uh, uh, obvious. Good, uh, or yeah, uh, comparable with each other. Good, um, yeah. Let me just uh, show you um, why why actually this mistake happened here. 
Um, I think in the old book they used a different perspective matrix. They used one zero one. Zero zero um, n plus f divided by n, one divided by n minus f zero zero zero. I hope that's correct, and that leads exactly to this vector here. And the point is, you can use any multiple, uh, any scalar multiple of the matrix. So, if p is a projection matrix, then uh, so is c times p with c is just a constant factor that we multiply all the coefficients with and you see that because here if you multiply all the coefficients here with the factor c you get a c here everywhere also here and but when we do the homogeneization so this basically means that you also have a c here and a c here then the C falls out again. The constant factor falls out again. That's why uh, I was actually thinking about bringing this in the tutorial as an exercise, but uh, since you had this, uh, saw this mistake here, which resulted from that, I thought it's uh, kind of good to, to explain it to you. Um, another comment, um, when I saw this for the first time, I was really yeah irritated because I thought, well, doesn't that screw up like the all the other multiplications that we defined, like if we have a translation and then we suddenly don't have a one in this fourth quadrant but a, vector, a, a value w, doesn't that change our whole result? The point is that it changes of course in between while you're doing the calculation you get different values but before you draw the point on the screen you do this homogeneization step where you divide it by this w, uh, yeah, by this this value w, um, and uh, that is why you then end up in the very same uh, same way. In the book, you find an example where they show it with translation. They just have the vector, and then they have different values there, and then they change it. Uh, I didn't bring that here because the book is kind of, don't get confused, I don't know why they did this, did they forget to update it from the previous version, but they they used a different notation in the previous year, and in this part of the book where they explained this, that it is uh, basically doesn't change the others, they used the old notation again, which was different in, in the new one, it is uh, x, y, z, w, and in the old one they use h x h y h z h and then the point is not like we say x divided by w y divided by w z divided by w one but the point is then x y z one and the original uh, one where we calculate with has this factor h in there it basically leads to the same result but I think it's very confusing if you mix both of them together, which is why I explained it now. So the people who have the old book, don't be confused about this new notation with the W that I introduced. The old one works as well, it's just a little bit different. And the people who have the new book, if you look into the exercises, there they are in your frequently asked questions, there they explain this and there they use this H notation, which is again confusing if you learned it with the, the W notation, but if you look at it, write it down on paper, you will realize those are actually really, it, it comes to the same result. Good. So, if we want to put this in our program now, of course we have to compute our matrices. Like I said, a lot of this stuff is taken care of by the API, so you don't have to really specify all of these matrices all the time, but some of them you do, and this uh, hopefully helps you then. Then we can multiply them with each other, and then, for example, if we want to draw a line from here to here, we take each point of the line, let's say this is point A and this is point B. Oh no, here. This is A and this is B and then we multiply the points just with this matrix and then we get a point p and a point uh, i've tried with the wrong right triangle this is 
yeah, you, you, you can understand it. P and Q on the screen by just multiplying it with this matrix and then we just draw the line by a draw a line between those two points. Good, so uh, we know now how to do this perspective projection, we know how to project points and lines, but we don't know how to project real triangles that are filled with color. So we need to talk about more about shading and texturing. We also already know about shading and texturing, but in, with respect to vertices, we didn't really talk about how to actually draw the pixels on the screen. And this process is called rasterization. and we will cover this in probably the next lecture. Then, of course, I said we assumed that all the triangles are within the few frustum, but we didn't deal with triangles that are outside of the few frustum, and we didn't deal with triangles that are partly inside the few frustum, where we don't draw this part, of course, but only this part here. And this is called clipping, and this is called culling, and this is also something we still have to talk about. And of course, so far we were only dealing with grid models, so we only had raster models. So you remember the, the cube that I drew drawn at the beginning was like that. But of course, if it is a solid cube, then we don't see those lines in between. So we want to have something like this. And this is called hidden surface removal because you don't want to draw the surfaces that are hidden. We only want to draw the front facing surfaces. And this is another thing we want to discuss in the next lecture. Good. So uh, if you haven't noticed, I put the final schedule online. There is a slight change. Um, there will be three more lectures now about graphics pipeline and related issues. So on Thursday and then next week. Then the following week on Tuesday there is no lecture and the reason is that there is a game jam from DC Dark on that day and that already starts I think at 8.30. I would be very surprised if a lot of people show up at that time but uh, yeah who knows. They uh, they they ask me if, if it's possible to consider that because it's on Monday and Tuesday and of course a lot of half of the course here is game students, so they they should have a high interest in it. And since we have two, uh, two uh, open open slots anyhow, and most importantly, it fits also well content-wise, I thought, why not skip this lecture? So there will be no lecture here and no lecture on the last date before the exam, because I always uh, want to give you some time to prepare. And uh, content-wise, it fits quite well because we have two closing lectures about ray tracing. So it's also kind of content-wise makes sense to have a little break here. Good. Um, but as always, check the website for last-minute changes. So this is the plan right now. It can change. Uh, I have more to, to say later. So uh, stay here. Don't leave. Um, Practicals, I hope you, you all saw the deadline. We moved it to Thursday because this year it was a little screwed up with this uh, the midterm exam and then we had the Herr Kanzing week with no, no break. So it was kind of difficult to have the lectures kind of more or less synchronized with the practicals. And of course, last week there were no TAs present, which is why we said just we just extended half a day. So those of you who run into time uh, into problems still have the opportunity to come Thursday morning. There is a session, as always, from 9 to 1 o'clock. And from 11 to 1 o'clock, I arrange that there is a second teaching assistant present. Because, of course, if the deadline is at 1 o'clock, it doesn't make sense to have a TA session in the, after, in the evening, which is why she will be also in a morning session. So you, there, are, there are more people there to answer your question. Um, in, uh, yeah, if you have problems with the submit system, just give it give it your solution to one of the TAs in the room on a USB stick so they can copy it before the deadline. Um, <coughs> considering the, uh, TSA, the, the TA sessions for the practicals, as I said on Thursday evening, it doesn't make sense to have one, so there is none. But we will have a second teaching assistant today, directly after the lecture and on Thursday morning. Um, we were thinking about dropping the Thursday morning session after uh, starting next week because we realized, of course, we did not expect a lot of people to show up at 9 o'clock, but even later there are not that many except for, of course, the day before the deadline, which is why this Thursday there will be a session. 
but we thought about uh, skipping it after next week because then we're a little more flexible if there is a lot of need, like a lot of people go often directly after the lecture, then we can put a second teaching assistant there so we're just a little more flexible. Um, now there are only half of the people here, but uh, would that fit your personal needs or is there someone here who really likes to have the Thursday morning session? You? You were? No? Because <laughs> um, we, we're, we're not doing this because we want to uh, uh, to have more free time. We're just, uh, we think it's better that way because if, if there is a date where you say at that day we would really, it would be good to have a practical but there is no teaching assistant there, you can also tell us. I mean, we cannot arrange a teaching assistant for just three people but if there is a larger subgroup here who says, I don't know, Monday afternoon is perfect for us. Uh, um, we we are flexible then, but we, we kind of need to know it. So there are no objections against canceling the Thursday morning session starting next week, and then probably have a second teaching assistance on the closer to the deadline around uh, at then in the sessions after the, the lectures. Good, yeah. So let's do it like that, and if you have any objections uh, later or recommendations about how we can organize it better, let us know. Good. Final thing, uh, tutorials. The uh, <coughs> regular tutorials start again next week. Um, because the exam results were not as good as I was hoping, we, uh, I agreed with the teaching assistants that it's a good idea to have one extra tutorial for the people who didn't do very well this Thursday. So the teaching assistants will be there on Thursday and they will discuss the exam with you and the uh, if you have related questions you can ask them. Um, <clears throat> the solutions are also online with additional comments so uh, if you already have uh, a good exam and you have the uh, uh, you can also just look up the solutions. You don't have to go there. This is mostly for the people who did bad or very bad, which unfortunately were quite a lot. Uh, so for them, I really recommend going there. Um, you had a question? Uh, no, they will not be there, but I could actually arrange that with them. The only problem would be that we have to kind of split it because there are two teaching assistants. Do you know when the th where the Thursday sessions are for the tutorials? They're both in the PBL, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I think about it. And if not, I mean, you can always contact me and we can arrange a date. Then you can drop by and look into it. Please look at the solutions first, but uh, if then you still want to look into your exam, you're, you're welcome to contact me. We gen just have to arrange it in a way that not every hour in a week, every another student comes in. We have to kind of group them, but uh, yeah, I, I usually don't offer a specific hour to do it, but uh, if you want to look into it, let me know. Good. Um, yeah, final comments to the... Uh, to the exam. Um, there are two major, yeah, I, I was, was pretty shocked, I have to say, when I saw the results because they were much worse than previous year and I don't think I did anything different that could explain that. The only changes I made to the course were actually related to the reasons that I think why it was so bad. Um, the uh, the major reasons that we saw by a lot of people were, I mean, one of the things is that they didn't answer at all or wrote something that was completely nonsense. So they obviously had no clue about. Um, and uh, that is confusing in so far as most of the questions were pretty much related to the tutorials and the previous exams. So I don't think there was much of a surprise question there. I had a couple of new things in my mind, but then didn't bring them. Um, and uh, so the only reason I can, can explain this to myself is that the people did not follow my advice to 
keep track with the lecture and do not fall behind because it is not really that difficult if you look at it, but it is a lot of material. I'm aware of that. So you really have to keep track. Um, the other uh, possible explanation is, of course, that people didn't follow my advice to do the exercises and go to the tutorials. So uh, if you're one of those, um, consider that again. Um, the second problem we had that is a more basic problem. Uh, the second problem we saw is a more basic problem. That's that a lot of people had problems with really basic mathematical stuff, like pure, simple arithmetics. And that is partly related to that it is a first year course now and the second year students from previous, uh, the previous curricula, they already had a, another math course, most of them in their second year. So they have, of course, more practice. And I was aware of that and the department was aware of that. And <clears throat> the, this is basically the only change I did from the course, um, which is that I made more tutorial exercises. I told you, you're not able, you will not be able to do all the tutorial questions in two hours because I expect you to do more and I purposely provided you with more material, so more exercise, so you have more material and more possibilities to practice. And also in the lecture, I more often say something when there is a calculation, yeah, I'm not going to do this, this is an exercise. And I told you also that you should take this as an opportunity to exercise. So especially the people who have problems with mathematics, who don't have a mathematical background, they should really take this at heart and really do calculations. And before, when you repeat the lecture, prepare for an exam, go through the slides. And if there is a calculation, even if it looks simple, try it, practice it, because that's the most obvious thing that I discovered in the exam that people they just make stupid, silly mistakes. So be more concentrated and practice it. You really need this practice, especially if you have mathematical problems. So these are the, the general advices I can give. Um, the, uh, so, so it's really Im important that you work on your weaknesses. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the department is aware of this with the switch to the gaming, that this is kind of... Uh, the mathematical challenges become a little higher for, for some students. And I just thought the, uh, discussed this also with uh, the under vice director, um, but there is not really, I mean, we cannot make a basic mathematic course where we teach you uh, plus and minus and multiplication. Um, <clears throat> but of course there are people who have these weaknesses. So you just have to work on this, uh, on this for yourself. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a final comment for those of you who did really bad in the exam. Um, today was really a heavy mathematics lecture. Um, the lecture today was very much on the mathematics side. This will hopefully change a lot in the future. We will have in the second part more lectures where we have pure, more algorithmic problems that we solve with algorithms, which also involve mathematics, but not like we had today. Um, and uh, so there is uh, still hope, if, even if you did a bad exam, that you have uh, a chance to go, do a good second exam and then pass the course. And if not, uh, let me remind you that I do the Herr Kanzing a little different. There is not one Herr Kanzing exam. There are two Herr Kanzing exams that cover the different parts. So if you do bad in the first part and fail the course because of that, you can just redo the first part of the course in the Herr Kanzing exam and then still pass the course. So the bottom line here is, if you have a bad exam, don't be frustrated and drop out of the course, but be motivated to do even better and catch up in the second part. You still have a chance to make it. Good. Are there any questions from your side? No? Then we meet again on Thursday. <clears throat>